Um, I'm Raleigh Martin. I'm a postdoc at UCLA Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, and I'm also um, active in the EarthCube Science Committee and Engagement Teams. And one of the things we've been trying to do over the past six months to year is to really increase uh, engagement of scientists in the development of EarthCube. And one way we've been doing that is through this series of EarthCube tools for doing geoscience webinars. Um, and Today, we're really excited to have a presentation by um, uh, Praveen Kumar and Mustafa Alag at um, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, and they're going to be presenting on the geosemantic framework for integrating long-tailed data and models. Um, and so uh, we have designed this webinar as a way to, for them to present their work, uh, hopefully in a manner that's accessible to a broad audience. Um, of scientists who may or may not be um, actively engaged in EarthCube. Um, so we're really looking forward to this um, presentation on this project today. Um, and one of the reasons we've been doing these webinars is to increase scientist engagement with EarthCube. And so there are several ways after seeing this webinar today that you can become more involved. Um, the first is to join the mailing list. If you go to earthcube.org, there are um, two newsletters you can join. One is a more general monthly EarthCube newsletter, and the other one is like a more detailed uh, weekly update, Monday update. Um, so anyone can join either of those newsletters. In addition, if you're interested in this project or other EarthCube funded projects, you can apply to the Visiting Scientist Program, which basically pays your um, cost of going to another institution where a project is being developed and to learn from that project. So if you want to learn more about geosemantics and apply to your research, you can apply to this program to get money to do that. Uh, similarly, you can apply to a travel grant to attend an EarthCube program, such as the upcoming Earth All Hands meeting. Um, and if you're interested, um, you have something that you're doing through EarthCube that you want to share, uh, feel free to contact us at the email below to um, sign up to give a webinar in the future. Um, so anyway, uh, without any further ado, uh, I'm going to hand the presenter ball over to um, Mustafa. Um, and just uh, a reminder, when you enter the room, you're automatically muted. Um, so just keep um, your audio muted uh, unless you're going to speak so we can cut back on the background noise. Um, great. Well, um, I'm going to hand it over from here. Thanks so much to Mustafa and um, How do we switch to Praveen. I'm going to switch it over now. And then uh, after their presentation, there will be time for questions. Share the screen. Okay, so I just shared it, or I just passed it over to you. Okay. Share my screen. I don't see it yet. Where is the WebEx? Okay, so we have to have a share screen. Okay, it's coming through. And um, just let people know also, in addition to asking questions by audio at the end, if you have any questions that pop up in the course of the seminar, um, feel free to send those either to me or um, to EarthCube community. Um, or to everyone during the course of the webinar. And I'll, I'll take note of those. Just using the chat box. Okay, Martin, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And you can see our screen? I can, yes. Looks great. Okay. So this is Praveen Kumar, uh, and uh, I'm the lead PI on this geosemantics uh, project. And uh, as you can see on the screen, we have a wonderful team uh, across institutions. Uh, so we are very excited to uh, talk about uh, the details of the project, which is dealing with uh, linking models and data, particularly in the context of the long tail. Uh, this project uh, builds on a lot of technologies and also contributes to a lot of the technologies associated with two other projects, Brown Dog here at NCSA, which is an NSF DIST project, and SEED, which is an NSF data net project. So, um, and uh, we work across institutions, so there are several people uh, involved. And um, the uh, essential idea behind what we are trying to do can be described in this idea of uh, long tail. So, uh, 
Uh, generally, if you think about long tail data, which is now a reasonably well established context, uh, we can think of it in terms of low volume, high complexity data. And these data can be produced by researchers, research teams, uh, laboratories, and as you get to centers and research agencies, you start to get into uh, large volume data. However, the small volume, but uh, small individual volumes, but uh, several of those contribute to a pretty large volume of data. There is quite a bit of heterogeneity associated with that. Uh, there is a large number of collections where they may be embedded. They cover a large number of scientific domains. Metadata may or may not conform to standards. The storage mechanisms might be different. The way these data are expected to be used is different. And if you look at the data life cycle, there's a lot of heterogeneity. So a lot of such data, the long tail data particularly, is coming from uh, field experiments, uh, individual modeling sim uh, simulations, field observations, uh, and so forth. So uh, the long tail projects, uh, particularly the ones which we have here uh, with Seed and uh, Brown Dog, they deal with uh, basically uh, the data side of things. Uh, however, we can also think of these con this concept of long tail as long tail models. And these models, again, I mean, you can have large models such as those run by NCAR and NOAA and NASA. And uh, you may think of small models such as those run by our group or your group. And uh, these may come about from single researchers, small research teams, various laboratories, and so forth. And they provide very useful scientific investigations, yet they are very, very heterogeneous and what we would call them complex in terms of the programming languages that may be used, uh, variable names for the same variables uh, that may be different, uh, the unit and time steps at which these models are run, uh, spatial resolutions of these models, the reference and coordinate systems might be very different, and the conventions uh, that uh, we adopt in representation of the model uh, would be a function of the science domain. So as a result, much like the long tail uh, data presents certain uh, complexities, the long tail model also provides certain complexities. However, the technologies are advancing and there is an opportunity for us to see how we can make uh, the long tail data and the long tail models interoperable. Uh, so if you go out in the field and collect some data, can they be fed to models uh, which can run uh, with that data without requiring a lot of effort on our part? So when we think about uh, this data and model interoperability, uh, we can think of it at many, many different levels. Uh, and here in the middle uh, of the slide, we have listed a, a few uh, modified from Wong et al. 2009, and at the Current time, our project is dealing with simply semantic integration between data and models. And there are other levels at which we would like to progress after this uh, <coughs> particular project. But right now, what we're going to do, uh, discuss is basically the semantic uh, structure that we can harness to make the data and models in interoperable. So when we think about uh, this data and models inter uh, semantic integration, on the one side, we have uh, the models on the right-hand side. And what we are approaching that is basically developing model as a service. Uh, so semantically enabled models, uh, which we can then run them as services. And the principles then uh, apply to the data also, so we can uh, develop a service-oriented architecture for data. And so this approach of self-describing models and data will allow us to integrate uh, models and data much easily. And that is sort of the vision of the semantic web. And so this model data integration, we are thinking in terms of uh, the framework that we are developing will provide uh, this particular structure. So just to uh, briefly talk about what those challenges are, which we are trying to address both in terms of model to model integration and model to data integration. And I think there is a lot of commonality uh, between the needs, uh, if not the technologies. 
So uh, here what I have illustrated is basically uh, thinking about two independent models. So model A and model B, they are independent. They have their own set of inputs and their own set of outputs. They run at their own uh, time step and uh, spatial resolution. What we can start then thinking about is basically coupling between the two, and we can take the output set two from model A and uh, pipe it down to model B. And what you will require is uh, essentially uh, some uh, challenges where basically the two models could be in different programming languages. You'll need to wa match variable names. You'll need to handle unit conversion in those. And you'll need to have uh, upscaling or downscaling strategies. So on the lower left-hand side, we just give you examples of how the names may be different or the units may be different. Uh, one can then also become more sophisticated and then have a feedback coupling between models, so going both ways. So now model A is not just driving model B, but model B is also integrated with model A uh, and communicating at the same time step. So in the previous case, when model A does drive model B, you might as well just run the model A and take the output and then run model B. Uh, but in this case, you need to really have this coupling going, and that is important. And uh, so the issues of integration between those are, again, related to the language and the variable names, unit conversion, upscaling, and downscaling. Now, you can take this uh, coupled model or the feedback coupled model and then have them talk back and forth with data repositories. And what we are hoping is that we can make this more seamless than what it is at present. And the challenge is basically the variable matching unit conversion, temporal schemes uh, that might, at which the data and models might be different, the spatial grid. So as you can see, the questions that we need to address in model-to-model -model integration is pretty much very similar to what we need to address with model-to-data integration. And so that's why addressing these two questions together uh, makes sense uh, going forward. So our uh, geosemantic uh, strategy is built on open API, and so our framework uses a microservice architecture and latent data standards. And at the core of it, we have three uh, services, uh, what we call the semantic annotation services, knowledge integration services, and resource alignment services. And the semantic annotation services, uh, as the name indicates, annotates the resources with spatial temporal context, standard variable names, uh, tr keeping track of provenance relationship. There are automatic extractors, uh, which can basically extract metadata information to populate uh, the data fields so that the manual work is uh, minimal. Uh, but if it is required, then we provide an interactive interface for uh, using that. Same thing with the uh, knowledge integration service. Here the goal is to register uh, control vocabularies uh, coming from various standards and so that we can basically uh, support multiple control vocabularies, not just one, and then we can provide potentially crosswalks between them. Uh, resource alignment service uh, addresses the need to uh, uh, identify the structure of the data, the time steps, uh, or the temporal intervals, the spatial grid, and so forth and also what the model needs and basically uh, develop the conversion that is uh, needed uh, for the model and data to talk to each other automatically. So those three are the core and then we have uh, models. As I said, we are using models as a service and just having a service architecture for models is not enough. You need to find something that will, uh, basically an engine that will coordinate the uh, flow of information between the models, get them to talk to each other. And that we are building on Emily, which was a technology developed by Scott Peckham. And uh, so we are converting that to a web-based technology. So we can use the service-based architecture uh, in there. And uh, we are, as I said, leveraging a variety of technologies. Seed, I mentioned, Clouder, which is part of uh, brown dog and has been in development at NCSA for a while. And uh, we are attempting to demonstrate the application of these uh, uh, data model integration on critical zone observatory for intensively managed landscapes and also uh, 
the SEN uh, group, the Sediment Experimentalist uh, Network. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mustafa, who's going to talk about some of the details of these technologies. Mustafa. So, uh, so I'm talking about the, I'll talk about the smell sanitation services. So it's a multiple services that aims to lower the barrier for using standards and easily implement them across the long tail repository. So basically, if we can annotate or enrich the semantics for information describing data, we will be able to enhance the data model integration, the federated information retrieval and data synthesis across different repositories. So basically, basically, we are trying to annotate the data on different levels, that is starting from the contextual, such as the spatial and temporal annotation of the data, as well as the content of the data, which I'm describing on the right side of the slide. So each data ent each data each data file, such as a CSV file, we have an entity, and an entity can be represented like a set in an Excel file or a CSV, which has this entity can be described by observation or what is observing and the measurement, the value, and each one has a description behind it. So the data that is the thematic annotation service aims to reach this level of details of describing the content of a file, as well as its context, and describing the provenance relationship between data files. So here I would like to show you the, some of the application of the semantic of the semantic annotation services. So basically, most of the semantic annotation services are working on three levels. The first level is retrieving all the information stored in a specific standard. The second one is searching across different across different related standards. For example, if you have if you have a control vocabulary coming from the ODM, for example, and the CSDMS, and you search for using a keyword, you would bring postal information from, from the two standards. For example, if you do the temporal time series annotation, you can come here and specify this temporal, and you put your information using a UTC format, then such as this one, you specify the beginning time, the interval, the interval and the end time, and you will get this information back to your system or to your data. Also, you can search across registered repositories where you can find, if you send a request with a one standard name, such as a wind speed, you can get both information. One of them coming from the CSDMS standard name and the other one coming from the RDM, as I'm showing here on the screen. So coming back to this, so the semantic annotation service is aimed to transforming the standards that, the standards that we are using for describing information into a web-based standard that can be that where we can write different uh, information extractors and parser against them. Now I'll hand it to you to show how this is implemented in Clouder. So Clouder is a data management client. Uh, I mean, it's a data management system that we have uh, developing uh, over the years, as Praveen mentioned. And one of the things that we did is we took it as an example client to the service that uh, Mustafa just described. So here on the right, you see a simple diagram where you can see that there is a Clouder uh, front end where you can upload uh, uh, files, create data sets. And in Clouder, uh, you have the ability of uh, annotating these files and data sets with metadata. And one of the things that we did is we extended the system to actually read the standard vocabularies from the semantic annotation service and then use that to store it inside Clouder. So, on, so again, I want to emphasize that this is just one example of a data management system that can call the SAS. And uh, the previous slide, Mustafa was showing you the uh, live documentation for the web service. Um, that you can go there and so any other uh, data management system can use the same interface to pull in this information. So specifically in Clouder on the left, you can see we're looking at a data set. Uh, we're adding metadata and we have this list of potential fields. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, that we added is SAS variable name. Um, and when we select that and we start typing into here on the right in the center uh, water potential, we see that we get uh, a list of results uh, that is filtered based on the query directly from the semantic annotation service. And uh, that list uh, right now is showing uh, standard names from both CSDMS uh, as well as ODM2. And then the user can uh, select one of these and uh, add it. And now that data set uh, has been um, annotated uh, with uh, information about what's inside uh, it. For example, in this case, we say we use CSDMS channel water temperature and as units Fahrenheit. 
We also added uh, the ability for administrators inside the system to actually manage what after appears on this list. And so uh, we have a way of specifying where these definitions will come from. So this is specific to Clutter, but again, this is something that anybody can do. And as you can see, the definitions URL over here are the uh, endpoints of the uh, SAS, basically, of the semantic annotation service. Um, uh, so, uh, in the case of Clouder, uh, we'll show a, a couple, we have a video, we have a couple of videos. The first one is an example of an instance of Clouder running on HCGS, uh, uh, the NCSA, the Illinois DDU. Uh, and uh, uh, in this case, uh, we'll show a couple of ways of how you can, a user can annotate inside Clouder. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so what we're seeing is we're gonna log in and we are going to create a data set. Excuse me. Uh, we're gonna give it a name. We're gonna give it a description. And then uh, we are going to upload a couple of files. The first file we're gonna upload is a comma delimited uh, file, CSV file. Uh, so we'll go to it and uh, we'll see that uh, we have the list of uh, uh, available uh, fields we can annotate this file with. One of them is SAS variable name. There's two subfields that we have to pull, uh, put in. One is the variable name, and so we're tapping in atmosphere, air, temperature, and we can see the list live from the SAS uh, coming in. And also the units. Again, uh, all this information is stored as RDF in the SAS. We can say a little bit more about that uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, so then uh, we show a couple of other endpoints from the SAS being called uh, from inside um, uh, Clouder. This is a very simple one. This is just uh, annotating with time, so it just gives you a, a very simple GUI uh, to pick a date and a time. So we, um, we decided to say, you know, that this data cover, uh, covers uh, um, the time span between, um, I forget, uh, January 4th of this year and uh, May 5th. Um, then uh, we're going to go ahead and upload a different file. Uh, okay. Oh, no, we're going to show that. So in Clouder, you can get this information back as the metadata in a machine-readable format, uh, JSON-LD. We use a lot of JSON-LD uh, both in the Geosemantic Integration Service as well as here. Sorry, that was really fast. Um, we're going to go back to it. Um, but uh, so now we're going to add a different uh, file type. Uh, we're going to add the TIFF, GeoTIFF. Um, and uh, we have created an extractor using some uh, brown dog technology uh, that basically runs some code that extracts information from the GeoTIFF. Uh, so we can see that the bounding box, uh, what the bounding box is, uh, a bunch of stats about the raster, projection, North America, 1983, and so on. And so these are two ways in which um, uh, we, we envision uh, basically systems to be able to annotate the data. Uh, one is kind of a manual user uh, driven process and the other one is a machine kind of driven process. So um, uh, something else that we have done, and, and this is very, um, uh, very recent, it's not, it's not really finished yet, um, is uh, another client. Uh, we have created another client that talks to uh, the SAS, uh, which allows you, so this is a, uh, sorry, oops. Okay, let's see if I can pause. Is there a way to pause here? Yeah. Okay, I'm not gonna pause it. Okay, so this is an external client. This is just pure JavaScript in the browser. Um, and what we're doing is we can take the URL of a CSV, in this case, we take it from the instance of Clouder uh, for the project, but it could be any URL online. Um, and if we put that information here, and uh, what we do is this client, standalone client, will load the CSV file. Um, and what it will do is we'll parse the CSV file in the browser. Uh, it will basically uh, parse out all the headers of the CSV. Um, so that's what we list on the left at the top. Uh, we, we show the first kind of 100 rows of the data just to give a sense of what's in the file, make sure that you got the right file. And then uh, what we can do uh, is basically annotate the same way that we're doing for files uh, but in this case, annotate specific uh, uh, column headers uh, inside this file. And so we're creating a mapping between a specific uh, column in the CSV file 
and one of these standard names. So you can see that the pull down again uh, returns uh, um, entries from uh, um, uh, CSDMS and ODM. Uh, in this case, we picked a specific one for the CSDMS. And so we can do this for all the specific columns. Um, and uh, um, with the idea that this mapping can then be used uh, farther along the chain uh, to make that integration between the data and the model uh, a lot more uh, seamless or at least support the user in doing that. Um, so, I, I, you know, we go ahead and add a few of them here. Uh, one of the things that we're working on uh, is how to handle uh, columns for which uh, the semantic integration service doesn't have. Uh, a um, basically, a, you know, a standard name that fits. Uh, so we haven't done that yet, but uh, we're thinking that the idea is uh, we just kind of allow the user to provide one on the fly and, and build it. Again, these have to be, uh, they basically have to um, uh, be universally unique, and uh, so they have to be identified within a standard vocabulary. Uh, and so then uh, what the user can do is look at this mapping, um, again, in JSON-LD, and down below we can see that we've mapped precipitation mm that string in this file, so this is file-specific, to a specific uh, standard uh, name from uh, CSDMS. And then the user can copy this to the clip clipboard and use it, but really what we want to do is uh, make it easy for, uh, to push this information back to, uh, you know, to uh, data management systems such as Clouder or other uh, data management systems uh, so that they can be used uh, farther along the chain. Um, okay, so I'll let Mustafa get back on. So it's clear from the previous, uh, previous slide the importance of the control vocabulary and the standard name. But one challenge that are one challenge that are hindering the integration between data and models is the mapping between standard names or control or a term that is used in a specific control vocabulary list to another control vocabulary list. So this motivation for this work or linking these standard names is the ability to search and discover different different data and models based on based on different control vocabularies and the semantic mediation between the information provided by one model to another or one data to or a data set to a model. Also the knowledge representation how we can how we can structure our information about a specific domain. The challenge here is how we describe the standard name, the methods they are described, uh, the structure, the content, the syntax of the text, all of these are handling the, are handling the mapping between different standard names. So we, we, think about, we think about creating a crosswalks between, a semantic crosswalks where we provide a relationship between different terms that are used in, in, in different domains. Um, so hi, Mustafa. Then, Mustafa, I, I apologize for interrupting. Um, I'm concerned some of the people in the audience may not know exactly what a standard name is with relative to just any... So, a standard um, name, so the standard name is the thing that Luigi was just presenting. This is a control vocabulary that are used to describe a specific terminology. For example, it's not, it's not enough to, specify, to say that air temperature, you, say, you have to say that atmospheric air temperature. And these standard name need to be represented by a name space that are providing its description. I'll show you, I'll show you in a second how a standard name is structured and how it can be mapped to a different to a different control vocabulary. Okay, thanks. So, so back again. So this this idea is so the standard name. Or the, so the standard name and the control uh, so the standard names here what we want to say that is usually confined in one schema. So one schema is used to describe a list of standard names. What we are trying to provide here is create a unique identifier for each standard name with its relationship and which with which its meta metadata or which with its information. So we try to use the linked data approach to provide a persistent URI for each standard name. Uh, and provide a schema for publishing this standard name, which is presented on the right side. So we focus on basic definitions for this standard name, and we deploy the Scott, the Scott ontology for describing this, which is organizing the relationship between different related information. You can see on the right on the right side of this slide that Scott provides what are the preferred labels you want to use for a name, what the labels, a list of the labels that are used for this name, what the narrow relationship of related to this name. So we consider this we consider this in two ways. The first one is we need the community to start contributing to the to the standard names and define their names. 
And on the other side, we are publishing this standard name, as, I can, as you can see here, using an endpoint. So in, in the, in, so here I would like to go for, this is a channel water temperature. In a different domain, it could be called water temperature near channel pad. So this mapping, as you see, there are an alternative label between this standard name. We need this mapping to be available. And you can see in the top of the, in the browser, you can see there are a unique URL for a standard name. So each standard name has its own information. Meanwhile, we are storing all the information related to the model using this JSON-LD schema or the schema that I have just shown on, on, on the previous slide. So back again to your question about what is a standard name. So here, if you look down, you can find you can find this, how, the, how the standard name is consist based on the CSDMS scheme. So CSDMS scheme has a schema for defining standard name. One of them is the object part. The full name is channel bottom temperature. That is the base quantity is temperature, and all of these information are stored with the with with the information. So basically, when you parse or you search, you write what from one location says that I need channel water temperature, and you need more specified information such as channel bottom temperature. You get this standard name, and you get the connection between them. So, you. I handed it to you to talk about the knowledge integration services that are based on the idea of creating these crosswalks between standard names. So, when it comes down then to use this information, both the semantic annotations and, and, and these links, uh, what, what we're building is uh, we're building this knowledge integration service that. Um, basically stores all this information behind the scenes. What we've shown in terms of the clients is how to access this information. But behind the scenes, we're taking in, we're pulling in uh, information, for example, for uh, uh, CFDMS standard names ontologies. Uh, we're taking uh, information from a semantic media wiki that is available for users to input uh, new terms. Uh, we're taking information, for example, in the case of what Mustafa just showed, uh, links in between standard names. So all of these different resources were kind of aggregating in one service. And uh, without going too much into details, basically everything beyond the scenes is, uh, is uh, um, uh, stored as uh, RDF, uh, Resource Description Framework uh, Information. Um, and uh, in fact, at, at the bottom, we, we mentioned, like in terms of the, the technical details, uh, they're all stored uh, inside using Jenna uh, in a triple store. Um, so what we show through the services is one representation of that uh, underlying information. And one of the things that we're trying to do with that is that we're trying to kind of use this service as uh, kind of a mediator between the different resources. So we do kind of do some uh, manipulation of the information as it comes in um, and as it comes out. Um, so um, uh, furthermore, um, what we're doing is we're starting to use this information to do queries on it uh, that are supported by some basic reasoning. So that if you don't have a strict match between two variables, for example, you still can get results uh, because you have that link that Mustafa just showed. Um, so if we go to the kind of live documentation here at the bottom uh, for the project, um, so we have a couple of examples that we currently have implemented. Uh, the first one is uh, given a model definition, so annotations on a model, and given uh, annotations on data, so uh, what kind of variables, for example, are in the data and what kind of variables are required by a model. Uh, what we can do is uh, anyone can use these endpoints to basically say, okay, go ahead and please let me know if a, a specific data set and a model actually match. And the way it does it, uh, so down here, I'm scrolling slowly, okay. Um, so in this particular case, we take a definition of a model inside the system. Um, I will show it to you uh, in a second. And we'll talk about where this information comes from. But for example, for this particular uh, model, 
uh, we can see that we need atmosphere bottom air over here, canopy factor, and we need uh, ODM to wind speed. And so we have a similar definition for the data, meaning annotations on data. And then when we call the uh, service with this information, uh, what it returns is whether there was a matching found. And the matching is not based on just string matching, but here we show that uh, what the variables required by the model were, what the variables required by the data were, and using some basic inference, uh, what the variables of the data were, and we can see uh, over here that basically uh, there was an equivalence um, uh, between two variables that uh, returned uh, uh, ODM wind gust speed, with, uh, which made it possible for the model to match the data. Um, so using the, that link inside the link data uh, vocabulary. Um, as we mentioned before, as Mustafa mentioned before, uh, we use cost exact match to establish these relationships. Uh, this is another endpoint that basically uh, you can use to give it a standard name, for example, in this case, ODM2 wind speed, and uh, call it and using and, uh, that particular uh, term, uh, that particular predicate exact match, it will return all the other standard names that are supposed to be equivalent using that predicate. I'm going to skip the next one. Uh, we have different ways in which we can define these rules. Uh, right now, our rules are very simple, um, but the inference allows you to create some very complex rules. So in the future, we want to explore uh, much more complex rules. Um, but the last one is also uh, somewhat interesting, uh, which is given a model and um, a, uh, in this particular case, a Clouder URL, so the URL of an instance of Clouder where the data is, uh, find me all the files uh, in that data management system that match, that are basically compatible uh, with the model. And again, this is done based on variable names at this point. Uh, we're going to be doing things with uh, spatial uh, and temporal dimensions. Uh, but so in this case, we say uh, in this particular uh, uh, instance of uh, Clouder, which one, um, uh, which files are um, compatible with this model? And so what we get back uh, is uh, the IDs of two files. One is this Soybrook CSV file. The other one is this Dog Canyon Data uh, Excel uh, file. And uh, the interesting one is the one up here where on the model uh, we uh, were looking for a wind speed, uh, but actually what we found on the file that was annotated inside Clouder using the GUI that we showed earlier on was actually ODM2 wind gust speed. And because we have a SCOS equivalent, this file was also a term which we wouldn't have if it was just a string matching. Um, okay, where are we at? Okay. Um, I'm not going to say too much about the resource alignment service. We have some algorithms in place uh, to do uh, mediation uh, between uh, both variable names, but also spatial alignment, temporal alignment. So given a file in one format or using a particular uh, you know, the, um, uh, format, we can basically return one that fulfills certain requirements. And these requirements would be something that we would get from that inference that we just showed. So we have some algorithms in place, but they're not available as web services yet. Uh, we have to do that yet, and, and then they will be available similar to the other the web services you have seen uh, so far. So now I'll hand it back to Pradeep. Okay, so, uh, I mean, the previous uh, discussion basically showed the need for a standardization of information about data and the variable names, and the only way we can get model and data to communicate with each other is by actually having some standard names uh, that both models and data describe themselves with. And so developing that technology uh, to be able to do that will allow direct integration of models and data. So with that uh, in place, we have also been working on making sure that the models can talk to each other as I described earlier. Uh, so this is, uh, as I said before, based on Emily technology uh, developed by Scott Peckham, who was with CSDMS before. And uh, 
the CSDMS uh, library uh, offers us a rich set of models to work with. And there is increasing interest in the community across different science domains to create libraries of models so that these models can then talk to each other or people can pick and choose which models they work with. And so I think uh, this takes us to a new level uh, of discussion as to how we can work with libraries of models across commu uh, science communities and that might actually allow uh, different science communities to uh, work together because uh, they have different vocabularies and uh, different uh, variable names and so forth. So with some standardization between data and uh, with models and between models, uh, we can work this uh, thing pretty easily. So uh, basically the idea behind uh, our uh, approach to uh, using models is converting them to web services, and basically what we do is we use the BMI-enabled models. So this is a technology developed by CSDMS uh, for what is called a basic model interface. It's sort of uh, information uh, about the model that the model can provide uh, to somebody who sends out a query. And once we convert this to a web service, then we can essentially integrate uh, these model functions uh, through uh, what we are calling MLE Web, the web-based uh, uh, MLE architecture. So uh, the BMI, I don't want to go into too much uh, details in there. Essentially, basically what you have is uh, BMI is a wrapper around a model which provides uh, self-describing functions about the models. Basically, all the kind of information that you would need to talk to the model without actually getting into the details of the model. So initialization, update, uh, getting the variable names uh, that the model uh, would talk to other models or uh, need the data for, and so forth. So we uh, have been able to convert these into web services, and uh, pretty much anything that is BMI described can be converted into uh, web services. We are, for our example, we're using what is called a TopoFlow model. Uh, basically, it describes uh, transport over the land surface with a lot of eco-hydrology and hydraulic component in it. And uh, <clears throat> the, here the idea is essentially, uh, basically, Emily serves as an integration engine between the different web services uh, at which the models are running and uh, passing the information back and forth, converting across time steps and grid uh, resolutions. So uh, it's a heavy duty lifting in terms of the scientific accuracy that is needed to make sure that these models can talk to each other. Uh, but nevertheless, the ideas are fairly uh, straightforward. So we're going to do a basic uh, demonstration through a movie. Uh, and then uh, we'll bring it to a close in just about three, four minutes. Okay, PC is gonna describe uh, this model uh, working. So uh, while they're getting that loaded up, I'm just gonna let people know that um, uh, we're also going to um, upload the recording and the slides of this webinar onto the EarthCube website within a week or so. So if you want to share this with someone else who is not able to attend, uh, just look back there uh, in about a week um, to get the link to that on YouTube. All right. Um, Emily Web is the web application of Emily to integrate the BMI-enabled web service model. So in a browser and ecgs.lcc.illinois.edu, Emily Web, and then we go to the main page. And to use Emily Web, users are required to log in. And if you do not have an account, there's also a link allow you to register. And once we log in, we can start to use Emily by clicking couple models button. And then we go to the page of selecting models. And at the left side of this page, users first need to choose which model are going to couple. So we need to choose uh, any model from the list. You can add a model or remove a model. 
for convenience, there's a checkbox allow users uh, to return the default setting of TurboBlock component. And we need to check whether these are model, whether these small models are connected or not by clicking the check model connection. And also on the right side of this page, users are required to provide the spatial information of these models. These are, will be useful to find data in any other data repository like product in the future. But currently, we are still developing it, so we will provide some fake information. And suppose we are going to run these models on our watershed, which is located in the upper segment water reservation. Um, and these are the spatial information of our watershed. And also, uh, users need to provide some temporal information, the start time and the end time. And once you provide all the information, just click the Submit button, and then it will go to the page of Configuring Models. And at the left side of this page, it lists all the models that are um, in the execution order. And then in the middle of this page, it requires users to provide the values or the files of the configuration variables. And here are some default values but the users are also required to provide the spatial files. For the turbo flow, it requires users to provide the slope, the aspect, um, the digital elevation model file, and the flow direction. So currently, all the files are uploaded from um, the local computer, but in the future, we try to find the data from Prada by using the knowledge integration service, which is described in the previous slide. So, yeah, so for, for the turbo flow, each component requires uh, at least one EM file, and we will move a little bit fast to skip it. I, this is Ryan. Sorry to interrupt. Could you wrap this up quickly so we have time for questions? Thanks. Yeah, we're going to just wrap it up. So anyways, uh, we're going to uh, – I just want to uh, quickly go to the end here. Uh, all right. So once you provide an um, odd file, click the Submit button, and then it will start to – create the runtime environment and start to uh, integrate the EMI enabled web service models. And once all the models are coupled, the results will return back to any web and show in the results and output page. Okay, so uh, you get the picture essentially that, uh, I mean, our goal is to couple the models together and then couple this to data, data resources. Right now we are working with uh, Clouder, but uh, we expect that these uh, ideas will be applicable to being able to pull data from Kuhasi or HydroShare or any other place and also put back the uh, uh, model output into there. So, I mean, in summary, what we believe uh, is that this framework provides the services that are required for seamless uh, semantic integration between data and models, and it enables model integration with distributed heterogeneous data resources, enables library of models to be interoperable, uh, enables data discovery and synthesis, and data analytics. And uh, going forward, I think there are some challenges associated with addressing reliability and consistency uh, in a scalable environment, if a lot of people start using uh, running these models, uh, how, how do we make sure that the scientific results are reliable and consistent? So that would be the next stage of development. Uh, but for now, uh, we would like to finish this project by basically uh, finishing up uh, the communication between the models and the data resources, which should happen in the next few weeks. and. A lot of these services, as you saw, were run live, and uh, so these are available as technologies uh, for anybody to use, and here are the web uh, links by which you can actually access all of these technologies, and if somebody wants to integrate into their effort, uh, we welcome uh, suggestions and contributions. 
We are offering a hands-on training at the Kohasi Biennial Conference in July for anybody who would like to come and learn about these things and adopt or contribute to our effort. And there is a link at the bottom uh, in there. And uh, with that, I will stop uh, and uh, entertain questions. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for your talk. Um, and so anyone, feel free to ask questions. Just make sure to unmute yourself. Um, and I'll also collect questions in the chat box as they come. So we have one from Mike Stoltz. Does the JSON ID representation for CSV use or relate to WC3 recommendations? Say that again, Martin. Does the JSON ID representation for CSV use or relate to WC3 recommendations? Say this again, please. The JSON ID which you use in CSV, does it conform to W3C recommendation? Yes. Yeah, they're all W3C standards, both the generic JSON LD um, as well as how we are creating the annotations on, uh, for example, the CSV files, the mappings between the columns uh, with uh, the, the actual standard names, yes. And, and when we pull in ontologies, we try to always get existing ontologies that uh, you know, are are used and they're popular, and a lot of them are W3C ontologies. Yeah, and we provide the context for this for these ontologies, like the namespace that are related to where we bring the standard name. So basically, when you annotate a CSV file, you have the final product is a JSON LED that are described that are that are related to the JSON LD standard uh, that are related to the W3 standard. Meanwhile, are describing the content of this file using the Using 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 fields from these standards or from the CSV. Okay. Hey, so another question, um, and this is a little bit different note. Um, as a field scientist and experimentalist, I'm someone who's more generating data than using data, and a little bit bewildered exactly how I would contribute my data in such a way that it could be then read into um, a resource like this. So, do you have any suggestions for how to go about? providing sufficient information with the observational data that I collect to so, make it useful here. So let me let me answer that and very quickly I'll turn it over to my colleagues here uh, in there. So uh, through the, our observatory project also we are collecting a lot of field data. So the first thing to do is basically create an account in Clouder which is available for anybody I suppose. Uh, and uh, then once you, you can upload the data into the clouder and as soon as you upload it, there would be a bunch of extractors that can run on it to if they recognize the data type. And if they don't, then we have all these semantic annotation uh, technologies that you can annotate the data very quickly with standard names. So once it is done, then it is available uh, to be harvested in any shape or form uh, we would like. Yeah, I would add that basically the two videos that we showed of, of Clouder and then the CSV annotation tool are two examples of web interfaces that are in place so that somebody can be helped in adding these terms without actually having to write all that semantic annotation from scratch, right? So what's important here is that we have that information stored in a machine-readable way that can be used by the system. How that gets created, we show two examples of clients that can do that, but we hope that people will build other clients that can also do that. In the meantime, uh, you can use these GUIs with your files by uploading the file there or giving the URL of a web accessible file and create these mappings using these tools and then the mappings would be what gets used by the framework. But there, is, there is already a large number of harvesters available in cloud for the, all the standard uh, types of files, right? I mean, if it's a GIS file, uh, it can automatically yeah. extract the metadata uh, in there if it's a uh, photograph, it will extract all the location information if it's contained in there and all that stuff. So. Yeah, so if you want to manually annotate, you have those clients. If you want the system to annotate for you, that's the example of the GeoTIFF extractor. That's an example of one where you just upload the file and there is some tool that knows how to extract that information in a standard way. So those are the two that we emphasize all the time is, you know, are you going to add that manually because you have that knowledge? 
and you're the only one who can add basically that annotation, or is it somewhat standard because it's embedded inside the file itself? So sim in, in a simple word is that if you, this file has a specific structure, we can leverage it and upgrade it to be semantically enabled, such as the JOTF file. Most of the JOTF file has this information included in the file. We are trying to map it to the standard and provide it as a metadata related to the file. Other files, such as the CSV file, need a human intervention. That's why we created the CSV web page where you can upload the file and annotate it step by step or, or column by column. Did that help? Uh, somewhat. I think I have more questions, but I'll, I'll save those for another time. Uh, sure. I want to give time for other people to have questions. Yeah, and you're welcome to contact us anytime with other questions if we can pro uh, help you. So anyone else um, with questions, either send them to me in the chat box or just speak up. Make sure to unmute uh, yourself. Uh, this mic, can you hear me? Yes, loud yes. and clear. Uh, just to follow on at a high level, so what if I don't have files? I have services that deliver CSV, but the data behind the services might be gigabytes or terabytes, so I'm not going to be uploading any files. Do you have a concept for handling that? So if you have very large files provided as a service, I mean, that would be very similar to what Kuhasi is doing, not maybe as large in there. Uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, do you remember when uh, we showed the uh, model definition? Um, I, I showed uh, an endpoint where we basically were showing the annotations on a model. Um, there are also annotations on data. And you have ways of uh, providing that annotation without providing the file. So basically what you're providing to the service is just the annotation that says, in the case, for example, of a multi-gigabyte CSV file or whatever it is, you basically say this URL has the following mapping where this column is annotated with this standard name and so on. Um, so, so we have ways for you to provide that annotation without providing the file. Um, in the case of, for example, the CSV annotation simple GUI, uh, because that actual tool has to parse the, the header of the file to give you what that list is, then it's going to have to get some of the file, at least the, the headers, out of the file. But in general, those are examples where the tool is helping you figure out what's inside the file. But if you know what's inside the file, you can provide that annotation without providing the file. Okay, good. So I'd start out the same way, get an account in Clouder and start. Uh... Yeah, that's actually talking directly to the Geosemantic Integration Service that has nothing to do with Clouder. Um, okay. So in that case, yeah, you, you, could, uh, you could do directly go to this, uh, this integration service with that information. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Um, well, if there are no other questions, I'll ask the final one. Um, it, so these tools definitely make it easier for data producers to contribute their data. Um, but what, what is going to motivate them? Like why, as an observationalist, should I take the time to go through this process on the website Clouder and add all of this information to my data. What, what do I get from that as a data generator? Well, the, the idea is basically to develop a community around it. So if you are a data generator and if you annotate it and I annotate it and some other people annotate it, then basically we start getting a very rich set of data from which we can do analysis, we can run models uh, directly. I mean, if you want to run your own model, just think about it this way. If you have a grad student who works on a particular project and uh, graduates, one of the graduate student may pick it up, but by the time you're down to the third level of uh, third generation of graduate student, that data pretty much is lost uh, in there. You may have a few publications out of it, but the data is not living in an active environment. Whereas if you use the system that we have, that data has a very long life. You are using it, uh, other people are using it, they can point. Uh, to issues with data which you may not uh, yourself realize and I have this personal experience where my model gives wrong results not because the model has a problem but the data has a problem and that can be then annotated as a provenance information in the data 
which uh, your own group can benefit or other people can benefit. So I think in some ways it provides sort of a social uh, communication around data, but it also makes data much, much more useful uh, for your own model uses, uh, your ability to link across models. Just imagine how much time our graduate students uh, spend in preparing data to run with models and then another graduate student comes in and uh, has his own idea about models and that data is no longer useful. Whereas here with some standardization, I mean, that all that will be seamless. So the amount of time that goes into preparing data for analysis or modeling uh, will be reduced significantly uh, with just a little bit of effort every time the data is uh, included into the system. Great, that, that's a great explanation, thank you. Um, and with that, I'm gonna close the webinar. Um, thank um, our speakers again for presenting on this topic. And actually um, coming up in June, on June 3rd, uh, first Friday of the month at the same time, we have a webinar on the Geo Deep Dive project, which along the same vein is about integration, in this case, uh, specifically about uh, observational data. Uh, so more on the data side, less on the model side. So I encourage you all to attend and check out the EarthCube webpage for more information about that. Um, and also check there in about a week or so if you want to download the or view the archive of this webinar. Um, so that, that concludes things. Um, thank you all so much for attending and thanks one more time to our speakers. Thank you, everybody.